Bracken, we would be talking uh, today about uh, your journey as a leader and, uh, and the different facets of leadership that you've seen as an entrepreneur, um, as, as, as somebody, as Manchu was telling me, that you, 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 you're known to be someone who's fired himself. And uh, so uh, let's hear all that. Over to you, Bracken. Let's start with a, with a, with a quick overview of your journey uh, as a leader to date as you stand as uh, one of the tallest CEOs uh, that the business fraternity was. Well, I, you know, I, I guess uh, I just give, I'll give a little bit of background. I I started in uh, I started in a small town in the United States in the state of Kentucky, and then I I went to college in Arkansas, which is another state that most of your audience probably doesn't know well. Um, I went to college there, uh, which is the equivalent of university. Then I uh, then I start then I went into public accounting, which is so I was an accountant. I was actually a literature, English literature major in college, but I somehow made it into the accounting world right after college. After four years of that, I went to uh, business school. So I got a, a, a graduate degree and I got an MBA. And when I came out, I, I made my way through Procter & Gamble, uh, General Electric, Gillette, and, uh, and then Whirlpool, and finally Logitech. And that's where I am today and have been for the last eight years. Fantastic. So in terms of your, your, your journey across industries and across sectors, Bracken, uh, uh, what do you think were the tallest challenges that you've seen all through the journey? I mean, you could, you could of course, you know, today's circumstances are very different, but some of the basics of leadership, some of the basics of, 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 of you know, business uh, heads have been same, traditionally same. So what are the challenges that you've seen over the years? Well, I'll put out a few. I'd say, you know, there are th two challenges that I've faced um, on, and they're, they're really balanced, so they're fun to talk about. One is the challenge of a turnaround. You know, you've got a business that's in trouble and you need to figure out how to get it to turn around, and that's usually not easy. And then the other end of the spectrum is the challenge that I have now, and I've had other times in my career, which is everything's going very well with the challenge of, of keeping that going. And so I guess those are, those are two of the challenges I've faced, faced, and I'm happy to talk about those two, but there are many more. <laughs> I, can talk, I can keep talking for hours on this. Would you like me to go deeper in one of those or both of those? Yes, please. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, I'd say the challenge, in some ways, a turnaround is easier um, in a way because in a turnaround, you know you need to change things, and if, it, if, if it's bad enough, you, you, you believe you need to change usually lots of things. Um, and depending on how stubborn the challenge is, you may be willing to change in a pretty radical way. So I, I'd say the most exciting and, and fun, some of the most exciting and fun moments I've had were, were in that context. I had uh, very early in my career, I had the, uh, the, the great opportunity to work on the Old Spice brand, which is a deodorant brand in the United States. And uh, it was one of my funnest jobs because it was really in deep trouble and three or four uh, business leaders had tried to turn it around before me. And by the time I got there, I was a very young, very um, uh, enthusiastic, committed, uh, humble uh, leader trying to, uh, and I, I, just, I thought I knew what to do. So I, I was lucky to have a boss or bosses who gave me a lot of freedom. And so I, I learned in that job that, or I think I learned in that job that, that changes, when, when you look at a big problem, it's very tempting to try to make a single variable changes. But when the problem's really big and really complex, you, you obviously need to take changes that are multivariate. And, and I did there. I changed, we changed almost everything about the business, but kept the soul of the brand in a way, if we did that. And luckily, that worked really well. So Old Spice was, was a big turnaround story at Procter & Gamble. On the other end of the spectrum, I've had other turnaround challenges. I had, um, yeah, but uh, in fact, Logitech was a big turnaround challenge when I got here. Um, you know, Logitech was was valued at about, when I came to the company, Logitech was worth about a billion dollars. It had had four years of really weak performance after a decade of super strong performance. And, and that decade had been, had been driven by serially entering new categories and growing market share in the existing ones. So a classic growth story, you know, three ways to grow. The categories were growing, all of them. We were entering new things and we were growing market share within the categories. I'll repeat that because it's worth remembering. 
there are three ways to grow in any business. One is to, is to uh, innovate and grow market share. Or, or, sorry, let me start with different. The first one is to be in a category that is growing. If the category itself is growing, you're, you're more likely to grow. Second one is to grow market share in that category. And the third one is to enter a new category. So if you can get all three of those working, it's magic because then you have all this, this accelerating uh, growth curve potentially. So at Logitech, we did not have that. So when I came in, we, um, we, de- we did the classic restructuring. We downsized the business, took out one, we, we, we flattened it, reduced, it took out one out of every four vice presidents and directors. At the same time, we also reduced the number of products we sold. With product families, we reduced by about uh, 35%, 30, a third, a little over a third. Uh, so we reduced that. We, we had a terrible first year. I, I, I always say, you know, when I came in, I had an immediate impact. Uh, I made it much worse. So we lost over $200 million in the first year on $2 billion of sales. That's not easy to do. I don't recommend you try it either. Um, and and so anyway, it was a really tough year, first year. But but we started step by step to to put ourselves in a position to grow. So I, I, I think one of the learnings I had there was try, when you're when you're trying to turn something around, try to trim back trim yourself back to what is, what's, what's potentially healthy if you can. It's a lot easier said than done because often you just don't have the room to do that, but we, we could do that for the most part. Then the, the, the second, um, so, so then we started to grow and, and, uh, and I'll tell the rest of the Logitech story at that point, cause it's interesting. We, we grew then for, uh, we started slow. You know, we grew, I think, 2% the first year, then 4% the second year, then 9% the third year. And then, and now we've continued to grow. And for the last five years, we've grown 9% or, or almost double digit or better every year, including last year. And, uh, and so we've, we've really had a good turnaround. The company, as of this recording, is worth our, our live, whatever this is, is worth about uh, 12 times what it was when I started. So it's a pretty good return for the investors who got in early. And if you, Fewer are still there, um, including me, um, and then and and a lot of uh, and the founder and other people. So so a good turnaround from that standpoint. And we the more important thing is we've really uh, made this business exciting. We've 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 serially entered new things. We we've uh, new categories. We've gone from about eight categories to twenty nine. We've expanded the number of brands. We've gone from mainly the Logitech brand to about six brands now. And we've uh, and we've we've re- really rejuvenated our innovation engine behind design. So we've really made design the centerpiece of our innovation strategy. And that really means we put the consumer in the center of everything. And then we try to creative, creatively either solve the problems they have with the, with the experience in the category or surprise them with new experiences or a better experience. So those are, those have been the kind of the hallmarks of the business. And it's been fun. Now I talked about, challenge of turnarounds yeah. i could also talk about the challenge of of successes can, can i ask one small question before that any questions yeah that's, this is yours you talked about turnaround and you know a lot of companies uh globally you know in in this part of the world also i mean when you look at india the, the there is a very common perception that uh, maybe maybe in parts it's true that there is a void as far as leadership is concerned you know? <coughs> leaders they are hard to come by and harder to spot. Having said that, in the current circumstances also, a lot of organizations would be seeking leaders who would be expected to come in and turn around. You came in, and as you said, you know, first year was, you you made it worse to make it better. So what do you suggest? What, What would you tell an organization who's bringing in a leader? So from the other side now, who's bringing in a leader and giving him the trust him or her the trust to come in? Okay, can you sort this out for me? But what do you as an organization do to make sure that the person succeeds? So three things that you would tell the organization that you would have seen, you talked about the room, right? So what would be three things that you would tell a typical organization that please do this if you're letting somebody come in, give him the room or, or whatever your, your, your recommendations are? Well, I guess the first one I would say, uh, when you select the leader, um, try to find a learner, somebody who really learns is, is a, is a, has a strong learning orientation. And, uh, because whatever that leader does, they're going to be wrong and, uh, they're going to be wrong in some way. Uh, I was wrong in many ways. You know, I cut product, I cut product, a, a product line that we needed, but I didn't know it. 
Um, so find somebody who is a learner. Second, uh, try to find somebody who's that, that unusual combination of uh, confident enough to act, but humble enough to listen. And uh, that's also maybe not so easy, but I don't think so hard. I think most of us know that we're, we're not gods. And no matter what our track record is, we, we're full of mistakes. And so you, you need people with humility because the reason you need people with humility is because there's going to be so much for that person to learn from the people who are already there. And I learned more from the people who are already in the company about what we should do than I did, than I brought to the company. So the, the, usually the intellect and the, and the right ideas are already there. They're just stuck and they weren't, they aren't stuck because there were bad people in the, the job before they're stuck because when things get tough, uh, people get very authoritative and directive and they, and they try to stick to the things they think will work and they get, and there's often a lot of critics. And so it is hard to, to be at the top when things are tough. So I would say that second one's really important. Make sure you bring in somebody who's going to listen because if they don't, you're in trouble. So finding that right balance between having somebody who's confident enough to actually make some strong moves, but humble enough to listen to the people who are already there. That is a really tough one. So I guess that brings me to the third one. Stay very close to them. So uh, not so close that you smother them, not so close that they feel like you're just watching every move, um, but close enough that, that, that you have your own, somebody in the organization has a little bit of judgment. Is this going well or is this going poorly? And I had that in, uh, in our chair who was very hands off because I think he knew he had been there through the really tough times and he felt responsible for it. So he wasn't going to tell me what to do. But he was close enough that I felt very comfortable with him as a sounding board as I went through the problems. And I, and I would always remind myself, well, he was here during the tough times. So even if he gave me advice, I didn't automatically take it. Um, so I guess that's, that's probably the, those are probably the two most important things. If I had to add one more, I would say um, if you're going to have to restructure, and this is a terribly unpopular thing to say, so I'll, but I'll say it anyway. If you're going to have to do a restructuring, which at the beginning of turnarounds you often are, Give the leader the leeway to go deep. In fact, encourage it. Because most companies that are in trouble um, don't go deep enough. And the benefits of going deep in a restructuring are twofold. One is it lowers your costs. Uh, but the second one is it, 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 cre it brings the leadership or the, of the company closer to the action. And that's really critical in a turnaround. Excellent, fantastic uh, insights, uh, Bracken. Let me ask you a second question, you know, uh, and, and that leads me to you talking about restructuring. And that is, again, something that we would see uh, far and wide globally across industries now, and more so as we're approaching the third quarter. How difficult it is for a leader to go through the restructuring right from the time it is conceptualized to the time it is... <coughs> You paid off all the severance. How tough it is. What does a leader go through? And it, it doesn't have to be about Logitech or any, any of the company, but generic what you've seen. Uh, I'll, I'll give you two, two different situations in there. First of all, it's always tough because um, for a lot of reasons. One, it's, it's a human action, you know, and it, and it feels inhumane. You know, removing anybody from it. Everybody on this call has probably either had to fire someone, been fired, or had somebody near them who was fired. And uh, it's a terrible feeling. You know, it's just never good. There's nothing positive about it. There are positive things to it much of the time, you know, and, that, and that's what you have to keep reminding yourself of. But it's not, e it's not easy from a personal standpoint. Getting below that, I think there are two situations to consider. Situation number one is you're a new leader, like I was at Logitech, and that you come into something completely new and you do a restructuring. Actually, that's much easier because there, you're, it's risky in a way because you don't know enough to maybe to cut in the right places. But again, from a prior point, if you listen well, you'll people already there will help aid you and what where what this what to protect. But the easier part is that you don't know the people so well, so you don't feel quite the loyalty to them and the and the the empathy and, and sympathy for the things they've been through to get to where they are. Um, so if you really have to do a tough restructuring, one of the benefits of bringing somebody in from the outside is that they will have an easier time with it. Um, on the other side, if you're in an existing business and you have to do restructuring, um, 
it's hard. Okay. But, but you, you just have to remind yourself that, that you're, you're why you're doing it. It's, it's uh, sometimes it's a matter of survival. Sometimes it's a question of making the company better. And, and your first job in that company is actually to serve the users out there. Because if you serve the users out there, you'll be serving the employees because they will have healthier jobs and more interesting and attractive jobs. The better you do with serving users, the better you are in generating an innovation engine that will uh, drive employment and loyalty and long-term, long-term uh, job creation. So I, I don't have a lot to say about restructuring because I, I just don't like the topic very much because it's, so, uh, it's not fun. But I think it can be rewarding. And I would encourage anybody who is bringing somebody in or promoting someone or just a, a witnessing someone underneath them who's doing restructuring to be super supportive because it is a difficult time. Um, enable them to go deep and, uh, and then, you know, be the, be the shoulder that they cry on um, when they shut the door because it is emotional. Absolutely. It is emotional and I, and I hope as much as we want to avoid it, but, uh, but yes. So, so that brings me to the next part, uh, Rackin. You have, uh, you know, I have used Logitech. I don't use a mouse anymore, but those are the most popular ones that we have here. So, uh, and, uh, but cross border, you know, global, uh, operations, particularly as something that is manufacturing as well as supply chain heavy as yours. How is the world changing for you and how are you managing the changes? More nationalistic, more self-dependent, as India is saying, more Atmanirbhar. I don't know if you understand that. Atmanirbhar is basically self-dependent as our Prime Minister keeps talking about. Okay. Uh, yeah, it is changing. Of course, the world's always changing, but it, it feels now as if it's changing much faster. And it certainly has become, um, you know, people, countries have gotten a little more focused inside their borders and a little less focused on global trade, although I think that's temporary. I, I do think globalization is an inevitable uh, movement, and I don't think it will ever really reverse for any period of time, any long period of time. I think it will keep growing, but that's just my opinion. Now, regardless, how have we, how have we or I thought about that or adapted to it? You know, we, we do most of our manufacturing in Asia, uh, the, the majority of that in China. We have moved some manufacturing out of China into the countries around. We don't have any in India yet. We've moved into countries around China. So that's an adjustment we made. Um, I, you know, I think, I think we have one big benefit, which I'd say makes our adjustments a little easier. And I better knock on wood. That's what you do when you're superstitious, if you don't know that tradition. Um, but we have one big, one big advantage, which is we have, uh, we have a long and, and tested ability to move our manufacturing around. And we've been, we, it starts as a company. Our first manufacturing site 39 years ago was actually in the, the very low-cost country of the United States and Switzerland. So two countries that are now the very high cost. And we manufactured there. Then we moved to Ireland. Then we moved to Taiwan. Then we moved to mainland China, then we, uh, and now we're in there as well as Vietnam, Malaysia, other places. So, so we've been moving manufacturing for, as a, as a, as a company in a large way for a while. We also move manufacturing. We move things in and out of our own factory a lot. So we use, uh, other, other manufacturers a lot too. And as a result, we use them to, to lower our costs. We'll move things in and out. That gives us a lot more, uh, f- uh flexibility, I would say than some companies and, uh, and we use it. So, Generally speaking, from a manufacturing standpoint and a globalization standpoint, I think I think we're okay. Maybe maybe the bigger question on the the one that I like to talk about more on globalization and localization is how do you manage the local requirements of a of a of a of a category against the global footprint? And I would say there we're not as good yet. We've um, we we have occasionally put, for example, completely dedicated teams in China developing products just for China within an existing category. And I think that's a really smart thing to do because then you're in China for China or in India for India. If you can afford it, if you have the size of business, you can do that. If the, ca- if the product development process works for that, I really encourage that as much as you can. It's a difficult one to do because the size is hard. It's, it's hard to do one country, which is, you know, X percent of the, of the world, but that's a great way to go. No, absolutely. I mean, from a channel perspective, you have to localize, especially when you're looking at countries like China or India, for that matter. I mean, India is called sure. India, right? Absolutely. Delhi and Mumbai are, are, are different beasts. 
So yeah, they really are. So, so have you been to India? Uh, how many times have you been to India? Never. Many, many times. I started going to India in two. Oh. Let's see. My first trip to India was, I think, was about 1999, and I've been going to India regularly ever since. I love India. Absolutely love it. I uh, love the people, love the culture, love the food. Um, mm -hmm. I used to say I could live in India. I, I, I probably still could. It's a, it's such a great place. So, great. Rakhul, tell me something about your, uh, you know, uh, we of course know you as a leader. We talked about your journey, phenomenal insights uh, from your, uh, your, your having been there, done that. It's the world of startups, new organizations, fledgling organizations, businesses, entrepreneurs being born all over the world. What's your, uh, what, are, what would be your three lessons for, I, I'm, I'm a fan of three because it's very easy to remember and, and yeah. to disseminate. What would be your three lessons for startup entrepreneurs who are coming in and building businesses in the country? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, I'm glad you said coming in and building because while, while we're a large company, you know, we have over $3 billion in sales, we have a model that we, that we call trees, plants, and seeds. The tree is the big mature businesses, you know, that are, that are sometimes really slow or even declining uh, because they're, the category is slow or declining. The, or our market share is very high. The plants are fast growing new businesses. You know, we're, as I said, we're in 29. So we've got some really hot, cool businesses that are just on fire, you know, so, and they're established businesses for us though. The seeds are completely new businesses. They're like startups. They're when, when we want to try to enter in a category we're not in or even create a category, which we've done several times, we, we, we get a very small team, usually starts with one person, just like a startup. And, and then they, they will sometimes recruit a partner and then they start to experiment with new product ideas. And then we fund them. We kind of drip feed the money to them until they get something off the ground. And then, then it either works or it doesn't. And, and I'd say our hit rate out of those is maybe one in four, one in five, not, not great, not bad. Um, meaning they really get in market and, and, and generate some decent sales. What have I learned through all that, as well as through meeting with thousands of entrepreneurs? I mean, I spend all my time with, uh, with fellow, with, uh, fellow with, with entrepreneurs if I'm looking for business leaders and not with um, people who do my kind of job. What, what have I learned? I think a couple things. One is, uh, you know, the, may, I mean, this is going to be a bit of a cliche. I mean, the most important thing is clearly just the uh, persistence, you know, because, and I'd combine that with learning again, because... I've never, I have yet to see an entrepreneur who, who ended up doing exactly what they expected in the beginning, you know, it just always changes a little bit, you know, it's just a, it's a constant uh, pivot for one reason or another. And I think one of the reasons why successful entrepreneurs are successful is they somehow get that intuition for when to pivot and when to absolutely hit the accelerator. And I think that's an intuition that you develop. I think it, it can be developed. And so I'd say, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you've got to learn to trust your gut. You just have to, because while the data is fantastic, there are so many things in, in entrepreneurship because you tend to be on the very leading edge of category development or category transformation. You're not going to have data that proves you right. If the data were out there, it, you wouldn't have a chance, you know, because somebody big would have already done it. So the data is not there. So you've got to use your, your sensitivity, your, connection to users. If you're a user, get inside your own uh, heart and soul and figure out what is the issue there? What is the real issue there? Is it meaningful enough if I solve it? And we, I had a call yesterday with, uh, with our, one of our teams about, about one category and it's, it's always the same. You know, it's like, is this big enough? I don't know. Is it growing? I'm not sure. Is it, you know, so, so that's one. So the second one is um, uh, be prepared for a roller coaster. And I mean an absolute roller coaster ride. If you don't like uh, instability, or and I say like instability because nobody really likes instability, but you, you kind of have to be comfortable with it going in, or you got to learn to get comfortable fast because most entrepreneurs have a roller coaster ride. And um, and I again, I'm no expert on this because I'm not an entrepreneur, ironically, but I, I'm 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 24/7 watching one and 24 seven uh, having entrepreneurs around me and I, my company. And they're all on this scary, exciting, fun, um, nail biting ride. And 
I think that comes to the territory. So you kind of need to be the sort of person that, that, that can live with that if you're going to be an entrepreneur. And I guess the third one is, uh, and this is a, maybe the most important one, is try to find something you really believe in or passion about. You know, it, it not, not just in, you know, I, I love India because it's just such a learning uh, country. You know, it's just so deep in learning and, lo- and, and rational and logical. Uh, but be careful. Don't just reason your way to a category. If you do reason your way to a category and you know nothing about it except that you've just got logical, that that's the thing you think has a big opportunity to be successful for you, find your passion in it. Dig deep. Find somebody who give, who find a customer or a potential customer who really cares about what you're doing and then fall in love with their their need and, and fall in love with solving it because it's a... It's, uh, I, I'm really convinced that that's the thing that gives you the staying power when the times get tough. It's the fact that it's going after something worth going after and you feel like you have a sense of purpose. And it's almost a cliche today. It is a cliche today to, to talk about purpose. And, and there are plenty of entrepreneurs who go into this with a very rational mindset. But in the end, when the going gets tough, you better feel like you're really doing something really worth doing. I, I, I could get all teary eyed listening to that. To that roller coaster because it's just to the extent of being dizzy 24 by 7. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope not. No. We don't want to get sick either. Yeah, but, but, but that's so true, uh, Bracken. Thank you. So my last question, Bracken, what do you think? You've seen, I mean, you, you have, you clearly have a phenomenal insight across not just what you're doing, but what you're also seeing around you. Uh, where is future for you? What is your what does future hold for you? What is your aspiration? What is the next step? And personal, professional, any which way, where do you see the world headed for you? Well, if you have a few minutes more, I'll tell my story about, about yeah. okay, I, I, uh, when I started this job, you know, it was turned around. We, we, we got it done with a great team. It, it, it became, in quotation marks, successful. And, uh, you know, we increased the value of the company a lot. And after I'd been here about five years, uh, you know, I'm a fairly big shareholder in the company. I mean, relatively speaking, I'm, a, I'm not wealthy or anything, but I have, I have a fairly large amount of stock. So I was, so I was, I was thinking, you know, okay, the, this was, wow, we're so different than we were when I started. Now what? Um, and I thought, you know, in five years, we'll be even more different than we are now, you know, because, because the world's changing faster. and We're so different. We're going to keep changing. And so I was thinking, you know, and then I thought, am I the right person to run this company? And I, I thought, you know, I thought that's a very legitimate question for a leader to ask after they've been there five years, after as much change as there's been and knowing how much change there will be. So I decided I was going to really critically ask myself. So I, so I wrote down what I thought the, the, the leader of this company for the next five years should have. And then I wrote down kind of what the spec would look like, what, what specification you would, we'd recruit if it weren't for me. And then I asked myself, am I, do I meet that spec? And I thought, you know, I meet it pretty well. I'd be, I'd be in the hunt for the job. If they're out hiring a new leader to replace me, I'd be, the, I'd be an option. You know, I'm not a bad choice. And I'm kind of proven, you know, so I, I obviously could, can, can stumble through and survive. So, so I decided, you know, yeah, yeah, I'd be a good choice. The problem is that, that uh, I, you know, if you've read Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, I have so much bias towards what I've already done because I hired most of the people I've, made a lot of the decisions, strategy decisions and product decisions and this and that. I thought, how in the world could I ever get out of my way? I, I, I really read that Predictably Irrational, which is another book on behavioral science. And, and I decided, you know, I'm just too biased. I think I've got to, we probably need a new leader. So I decided I would fire myself. So I, I decided to fire myself. But then after sitting there a few more minutes, I was about to go to bed and I was really serious about firing myself. But I also know that it's really good to sleep on decisions. That in the morning, I was going to revisit that decision, make sure it was the right one. So I went to bed and obviously I woke up and I had this epiphany, you know, that I often have when I sleep on decisions. No, I'm, I'm going to rehire myself, but only on one condition, which is there are no sacred cows. I'm going to come in it objectively into this job as if I'm starting over again and I'm going to change things. And I, man, oh man, did I. And, and that, that process, which probably culminated, it was probably a result of things that I've been thinking about my entire life captures something that I, that I guess I think about when I answer your question about what's next for me. Um, I want to be in a constant state of treating every, everything like it's new, you know, and, and, and really trying new things all the time. So I'm in a, I love, I love the feeling of being a beginner and of, uh, of, of, 
adventure, venturing out into the unknown and exploring something new. And so whatever I do next, uh, even if it's sitting in this chair and doing exactly what I'm doing right now, I'm going to be trying to be a beginner again and be objective about everything I do. I take the autopilot and turn it off and start over again. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Rankin, is there, is there anything else that you would like to add uh, to our conversation? It's been phenomenal. No, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's been really fun talking to you and it's a, a real honor to, to uh, get a chance to, to be listened to by uh, Indian leaders. You know, we have so many great uh, Indian leaders in our company and throughout all the companies I've worked with before, both in India and outside of India. And, you know, it's, uh, you have changed the world, you know, and you are changing the world. You know, I think it's kind of amazing to me what an incredible engine of intellectual horsepower and, uh, and human horsepower that India really is. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And I've been, as I said, I'm an India file and I've been, I've been one of those people that from the late nineties kept saying, India is going to have this growth spurt that's going to look like what China did. Um, and I believe that and it's coming. And, uh, and so I think investing in India, believing in India, uh, create, making sure you have your products really fit the, the India market is so critical and we don't do it well enough, you know, but we will because I'm a believer and, uh, and I got plenty of people in my company who are believers. In fact, my leadership team has several, uh, Indians right at the top. So, uh, we're coming, we're going to do better there. Please buy our products. Mm -hmm.